want to tell you how America still works and maybe give you some tips on how to start a variety of businesses with little to no money. But she had touched upon one thing in high school. I was in a high school class with my friend Michelle Gillian, and I sat in front of Michelle, and we was in 11th grade, we would pass notes back and forth, so we were really clever. She sat behind me, so I would like write a little note, put it and I like that, you know, lean back and she'd grab it. Well, one day, Mr. Wax intercepted our note and read it to the whole class. Oh, this Johnny guy and this Michelle, I'm gonna read the note. Something stupid like, see at Winchell's, you know, after school, uh, uh, you know, Darlene Googler and Ron are gonna be there. Something really, really silly. You know, we were just buddies. It said, they will never amount to anything. Well, Michelle Gillian, two days later, I should say two years later, became Michelle Phillips of the Mamas and Papas, who's an actress, was a superstar, and so forth. So on my 50th birthday, Michelle and I have always remained friends. She went and found Mr. Wax and brought him to a place called El Cholo in LA, a place we go to for dinner after in high school, brought him there, and we reminded him of the situation. <laughs> and he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I want to tell you that America works, America works really, really well. And the rest of the world is following regardless of publicity that some people put out. Yeah, there are some things wrong with our country, but boy, we're straightening them out really quick. We the people are taking over. In life, you're gonna see things that you think are real or read things that you think are real. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. What is very real is that the economy you're in today is not what the press makes it out to be. I'll give you an example. In 1980, when I started John Paul Mitchell Systems with my partner, inflation was 12.5%. What is it now, 1%? Interest rates were 18%. Was it now 4, 5, 6, 7%? Unemployment was 10.5%. And you had to wait in line for sometimes blocks at a time to get gasoline. You know, actually, most of you weren't even born then, but that's how it was, it really, really was. It was a lot worse than this today. But yet, people say, yeah, look how bad the economy is. Maybe not the best time to start a business. In 1980, we started John Paul Mitchell Systems with $700, that's it, no loans. Today, it is probably the largest uh, independently owned hair care professional company in America, and growing, we're in 87 countries throughout the world, and growing quite rapidly. But America does work, and our way of doing things works. No matter whether you agree with the politicians, you don't agree with the politicians. Look around the world a little bit. Why the uprising in Tunisia? Why do you have uprisings in Egypt where they didn't before? And all of a sudden in Iran, they're saying, wait a minute, you know, we threw the Shah out. Mullahs, you're not doing any better. You know, we want you. I mean, why is this going on? Well, obviously, as most of you know, we're in the technological age where they have email, they have Twitter, they have everything you could ever imagine so they know what's going on in the world. More people in the world want, deservingly, a better chance, a better opportunity to at least have the opportunity for a better life. And they're watching it now, what's going on throughout the world, and saying, well, that's not so bad. Maybe these bad guys aren't really that bad. Maybe what's going on in America, where we the people, hey, Obama came in. Man, that guy gave great speeches. I thought, wow, I don't believe this guy. He's going to knock out immediately pork barrel spending. It's going to be gone. He said he would in the election. Let's go for this guy. Yay, finally someone's going to do something. All of a sudden, every bill that went through had pork barrel spending. So what did we the people do? We didn't wait four years. Two years later, we started kicking out Democrats and putting in uh, more uh, Republicans or independents. Because we, the people, are speaking up. We, the people, don't want anymore. All of a sudden, the Republican Party jumps in and says, oh, we're going to stop pork barrel spending, even though it's been going on for years. We didn't do it during our administration, but we're going to do it now. Because Obama said he would and didn't. It's politics. But the end result of politics is things are changed, they are getting better. I want to share with you how to start a business with little to no money, using Paul Mitchell as a great example of this, and then also go into a few of the other things we do, and maybe some real secrets to success. I want to start with two things. It's the most asked questions of me. John Paul, what is the main, main thing we should know 
to be successful in anything we do? And is there a second one? And I'll tell you those right off the bat. The first one is this, and I'll explain it. Be prepared for rejection. Be prepared for a lot of rejection. I don't care how good your idea is, no matter how unique it is, you're going to be knocking on doors or talking to people to sell your services or sell your product. And you're going to get a lot of rejection. If you're aware of it in advance, it won't be like, wow, this is not a good idea. 20 people said no. You have to be able to knock on door number 100 and be just as enthusiastic on that door as you were in the first 100 doors that were slammed in your face. Be prepared in advance for rejection. I sold encyclopedias door to door when I was 19, 20, 21, and 22 years old for Collier's Encyclopedia. I believed everyone needed a Collier's Encyclopedia. A high school student could understand it. A college student could tolerate it, okay? May not be Britannica, but was, everyone needed one. So I sold them door to door. No appointments, just went out there knocking on doors. And all of a sudden, if they let me in, all these bindings red and blue would come out. But I believe what I did was right. I had a lot of rejection. Doors slammed in my face all the time. And people that weren't very courteous. But then again, I was calling on their homes in the late afternoon throughout the evening. I wasn't expected there anyways. The average encyclopedia salesman in those days lasted three days. I lasted four years, and then I got out. Commission only. But one of the things I learned was, believe if you believe what you're doing is right, don't give up. The successful people do all the things the unsuccessful people don't want to do. That's number two. Successful people do all the things unsuccessful people don't want to do. Like on door number 101, smiling and being enthusiastic, not giving up on what you're doing, and being really into it. I want to give you, that's phase one, part one and part two. The other secret to success, its own category, is whatever service, whatever product you are selling, make sure it's of the highest quality in its category you could possibly have. You do not want to, and I would underline do not, you do not want to be in the selling business. As most everybody does, I want to sell my service, I want to sell my product. You don't want that. The big secret is you want to set up your business so you're in the reorder business. Your service or your product is so darn good that people are going to want it again or tell other people, you got to get this, it's that cool. That's how you build a business. You start in the beginning saying it's going to be so good that I'm going to be in the reorder business. People are going to want to talk about me. People are going to want to say, this is great. How do you start a major cosmetic company 30 years ago during the worst economy in the United States since the Great Depression, the real worst economy since the Great Depression, with $700? Well, we thought it was impossible. I had my partner who was a hairdresser. His name was Cyril Thomas Mitchell. He used the name Paul Mitchell as his hairdressing name. And John Paul DeGioria, John Paul Mitchell Systems, that's where he got that name together. And I was from the business end, the marketing end, and knew a little bit about product formulation. And my partner was a great hairdresser, like one of the most avant-garde ones you can imagine. He knew products, he could use them. So I said, Paul, I've been in the industry myself as an executive, and I said, why don't you and I start a company together? I'll raise the $500,000 we need. And you loan 30%, I'll loan 30%, and the money will loan 40%. We had an investor from the tax-free haven of Jersey between England and France. And Dick Holthouse with City Corp set it all up for me. He was a friend of mine. And then it was all set to go. And that day, I wasn't getting along with my wife, wanted to get out of there anyways. I left her whatever money I have, left her the house, a nice car with my daughter, plenty of money for a few months, you know, and put a few hundred bucks in my pocket, jumped in my car, and went down to the bank. My partner Paul came over. He was out of money, too. So he came on over, so we'll get our $500,000 in. Paul, there's a few thousand for you. I'm going to rent an efficiency hotel or apartment for a week or two or a month till I see where I want to situate myself, and we're in business. The money never came in. That night, the money still never came in. What are we going to do? Dick Holthouse got a hold of me through a friend of mine. And so I got out to JP. It's 3 in the morning in England when he finally gets a hold of me. It's the evening. The banks are closed. So I don't want to tell you this, JP, but I just have to. The backer pulled out. 
He says inflation is such and such in the United States, 12.5%. Interest rates are 18%. Unemployment is 10.5%. Uh, there's a, a fuel shortage going on. And your hostages, there's over four of them still in Iran that they're holding. They're not released yet. I can't invest in the United States where they're, oh, my God, no money, great idea. I already set up the bottle man. I set up the silk screener. I set up everything to just pull the trigger and go. We didn't have any money. How do you start a business with zero money? So I'm gonna give you everything we did. We didn't have an office, but I had a friend with a telephone. My office was an answering machine that you could buy today for $29.95. I got a friend of mine who had an English accent and she said, hello, John Paul Mitchell Systems. Oh, we're so busy, but leave a message, we'll get with you. It looked like we were bigger. There was just Paul and I, that was our office. We need a location. I went to Universal City, California, to the little post office there. For $15, I got a P.O. Box. John Paul Mitchell Systems, P.O. Box 10597, Universal City, California. We had a phone. We had a secretary that didn't exist, or someone answering the phone. That was it. For stationery, I would go to a print shop for $3. They would typeset and make me one copy. That was my stationery. I would go to a photocopy place for four cents a copy and make many copies. I now had stationery and I had letterhead and I could draw on there an invoice so I could invoice people. Okay, fine. You have a make-believe office set up, but how about the products? Well, everyone was set up to do 100,000 of each bottle. And you know they were excited, they were enthusiastic, we were enthusiastic, I was excited, enthusiastic, but nobody knew we didn't have any money. We didn't want to lie, but we didn't want to quite tell them everything. So I called up the silk screen, the bottle man. Got to start with the bottle guy and said, instead of ordering 100,000 bottles, I'd like to have a sample run of 10,000. Oh, of course, we understand, no problem. We'll give it to you the same price. Called the silk screener. 10,000 are coming over and it's a sample run. I want 300 shampoo one, 300 shampoo two, and I mean 3,000, and then I want the other 4,000, the conditioner. Ah, no problem, and by the way, don't put the color on because color was seven cents a pass. Black and white was two cents. So our bottles came out black and white. Turned out it was great, unisex. We didn't know that. We just knew it was a lot less than Silk Screen them. <laughs> Called the filler up. You got all the supplies. We just need a, a 10,000 fill. 3,000 of this, 3,000 of that. Okay, and all of a sudden, bingo, the clock started ticking. From the time the silk screener got it, I mean, the bottle guy got it to the silk screener, got it to the filling house, we had them full, was two weeks. It was two weeks longer, because I had set up credit with everybody prior to this time, 30-day credit. Two weeks from now, that first bill is due. I hit the streets, knocking door to door like I was selling encyclopedias, but I would go from beauty salon to beauty salon to beauty salon. We had a shampoo that instead of using two shampoos, more product, rinsing it down the sink, you know, it goes away, you only need one shampoo. Saves you time and money. Our conditioner, you didn't put it in the hair in the salon, leave it for 10 minutes, rinse it off. You take the customer to the station, you sit them down, you put the conditioner in your hands, you show them, you run it through their hair and leave it. And you tell your customer, this is a moisture treatment, this is a protein treatment, it's gonna let me cut your hair easier and when I blow dry it, it's gonna cause less damage to your hair because it's a protector. So we knew that, and by the way, hairdresser, when you put it in your hand and you do this every time, it neutralizes all the chemicals in your hand. So I would go in and give a presentation. Here's my product. Most people would say, well, why do I need your product? You know, I've got Zotos, I've got L'Oreal, I've got Rec, and they go down all the you know, regular company's lines. I don't need your product, you're an unknown. I said, well, here's what I'll do. If you will agree to take one dozen each of what I have, and use my shampoo and conditioner at every station you have, I'll make this agreement with you. And display it, by the way, at eye level. Black and white looks so good at eye level. If you will do that, and you are not satisfied as one of the hottest products you've ever used, and recommend to your customers to take home, I will come back, take every bottle off the shelf you have not used or sold out the door. Still a good bottle you haven't used or sold yet. I will give your money back on all of it. Now, is that fair enough? The answer was usually, no, we don't need your product, okay? We have all these <laughs> other products there, right? Finally, I'd say, okay, 
I can understand your skepticism. But if it works the way I say it does, and your customers love it, and you love it, you're going to want to recommend it. I'll tell you what I'll do. If you will agree to have it at eye level, a nice little display, let me come in and hold a little class for your stylist on how to use it. I will place only six bottles of the shampoo, six bottles of conditioner, six bottles of you know, everything in your salon. And I'll also give you this within one month, 30 days, if you're totally happy, anything you haven't used or sold out the door, I'll give you your money back. Is that fair enough? And the same with your customers. And some would say yes, some would say no. They'd say, okay, I can understand. If I only gave you two bottles, and it's, <laughs> and it's amazing how many people only took two bottles or six bottles. I went around and I got 12 people to buy it, I had it in my trunk, so I took it out, here's your order, can I have the check? <laughs> they gave me the check. I went down to Paris Ace Beauty Supply in downtown LA, who was calling on salons, and I said, would you like to be the distributor for this new hotline? We call it Paul Mitchell because my partner's a hairdresser. I'm not. It'll only be in the hairdressing industry forever. It's not going to be like Nexus or Jeremac or all these other companies that sell you out. They let the hairdressers build them up, and then they go retail with their lines. It'll always stay in salons. Uh, so that's why you should buy our product. Here's how unique it is. He said, we don't need to buy your product. We have a Link Curtis. We have, he just went on and on. I said, but I'll tell you what. If you knew customers were going to buy this, would you take it on? Yeah, but who knows that? You don't know for sure. I whipped out 12 orders, put 12 checks right in front of them, and said, that's your first 12 orders, and there's the checks for them. I haven't cashed them yet. For $2,000 in product, you could be my LA distributor exclusively for all of LA County, and I'll come here and help you sell it. He looked at it, laughed his head off. His name was Jim Hendrietta, laughed and said, Okay, I said, but just one more thing. When I deliver the $2,000, I'm a new company. I really need a check. He laughed and said, hey, we pay our bills in 45 days. Well, knowing that in advance, I priced my products at 5% over what I really wanted. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a 5% discount. Give me a check on the spot. I need the money. I already had this in my mind. Yeah, how do you get money right away? Well, whatever your price of your product is, up at 5% and give it right back to them for paying you right away. To this date, Paul Mitchell gets paid COD or within 10 days. And we still have that 5% in there. No one ever doesn't take it. How you get in the door? So he said, okay. And I drove around back to the warehouse. <laughs> warehouse, man, this stuff is for you. Can I have a check? He calls Jim Henrietta. We had Jim Henrietta about 10 years ago to one of our meetings to tell everybody the story. He says, I'm sitting in my office, the phone rings, with my warehouse manager, and he says, you're not going to believe it, some guy back here unloaded products, he wants to check. He says, what does he look like? His name is John Paul. He was just in my office five minutes ago. <laughs> Laugh, gave us a check, and that's kind of how we took off with grassroots. If we wanted to cross the nation in those days, you could fly for $99, the midnight special, from Los Angeles to New York. Hardly anyone's on that plane. You pick up the little dividers, you sleep on it, and the bathroom is your shower. So you learn as you go along various ways to, shall we say, save money and to, along the way, build a business. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about also, as you build a business, how to manage it where you don't lose people. In 31 years, John Paul Mitchell Systems in 87 countries throughout the world has had a turnover of less than 30 people. That's unheard of. People say, how do I get a job at Paul Mitchell? There are no positions because nobody wants to leave. We'll occasionally have a new one with expansion. But we treat people the way we want people to treat us. So I'd like to take a moment, because there's just so much to cover in such a short period of time. I want to take just a moment with you to give you some very important management techniques that will last you for the rest of your life and maybe some personal techniques on getting along with people. I want to cover with you right now how to reprimand somebody if you're a manager or an owner of a business. Whenever you reprimand somebody, if I went up to this lovely lady here and told her what she did wrong, she'd feel really bad when we left each other. She wouldn't feel good at all. There's a way to reprimand somebody where they feel really good when they leave. Before you do it, you need three things. You want to write down on a piece of paper what it is they did wrong. Second of all, you want to write down so you know it how to do it right. You'd be amazed at how many people get scolded for something. They didn't know how to do it right, but they won't admit it. How to do it right. And the third thing is, 
It's the last thing, the most important. What do they normally do really, really good? What do they normally do really, really good that you could tell them so they feel like they're really wanted and they really are someone that you appreciate and respect? And when they walk out, they're happy being reprimanded. You know these things when they call in and they come on in. You always reprimand privately behind closed doors. Never reprimand anybody in front of anybody else. You do, and that's covert hostility. They'll stab you in the back whenever they can. Only reprimand people behind closed doors and in private. First thing you do is you tell them what it is they did wrong. The second thing, how to do it right. I'll give you an example, okay? You come in every day on time, and you're great. People love you, but when you answer the phone, you're not smiling. It's like, hello, can I help you? Stanford University or John Paul Mitchell Systems. If you smile like we suggested before, your brightness, your beauty comes across, and the person at the other end of the phone knows it's a happy company. Hi, John Paul Mitchell Systems or Stanford, how can I help you? Big difference. You are incredible. You come in all the time, people love you, you bend over backwards to help people out. Because you're that cool, and you do everything that wonderful, one would expect you to do this thing also, because you're that, you're that great at what you do. She walks out feeling good. It's the opposite. It's the total opposite for uh, praising somebody. Whenever somebody did something good, praise them loudly and in front of as many people as you can. Like if there were people walking around that worked with you, oh my God, you're unbelievable. You smile, you made people happy on the other of the phone. Guys, she is too cool. In other words, tell them what they did right in front of a lot of people or make sure there's someone around so she knows that someone else heard what she did right or he did right. Very important business. The old school was, I want you to do this. Why? Because I said so. That is not management. The worst book ever written in the world, and it was a bestseller 40 years ago, it was called Management Through Intimidation. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> it was a book, it was a big size. How could anybody possibly want to do that? And the other thing gets into treating people how you'd want to be treated and not lying about what you're going to do. We're the only major company left in the professional beauty industry. I could be two, three times my size if I opened up the Paul Mitchell line to drugstores, supermarkets, everybody, but I don't. I go on TV and say, if you ever see Paul Mitchell in any drugstore or supermarket, it's counterfeit or it's from the black gray market. We don't put it there, don't buy it. Even the counterfeit bottles say, uh, guaranteed only when sold in a professional salon. They're really good, don't buy it because we only sell our product in salons. That's all black market, gray market or counterfeit, don't buy it because we're only in the beauty industry. We told hairstylists, if we make it, we're gonna be in the professional beauty industry forever. We are never gonna cut you out of the picture. We will never desert you when you build us. And they did. So ethics is another good thing. If you say you're gonna do something, by gosh, you wanna do it, you wanna do it right away. Another area I wanna to touch on with you here because it's very helpful and I know when I was at uh, various government agencies, I do some lecturing for uh, some of our, our agencies, uh, CIA, the FBI, and I do a little lecture here and there for the Secret Service and other groups. Uh, what I lecture on is management motivation, business, and just a lifestyle of being happy so everyone just feels good. And I feel that if you're a citizen of any country and you want to change it, by gosh, get in there and motivate people. If I don't like the way someone's doing something, why don't I get in there and talk to their agents or talk to their people about another belief, a new way to do things, uh, be a more loving, kinder manager where people want to do more for you on a regular basis and don't want to leave. There have been times that I've been at John Paul Mitchell Systems corporate headquarters at five in the afternoon, 5.30, and half the office is full. I said, get out of here. Go home, what are you doing? Get out of here. No, no, we want to finish this. Get out of here. No, no, JP, it's okay, we want to finish this because they feel they are part of it. And we treat people as they should be treated. And there is free lunch, by the way. John Paul Mitchell Systems, everyone gets free lunch. We have utensils, you know, so they're recyclable. We bring food in big, different restaurants in large quantities, recyclable. If you carpool, we pay for your gas. We do unto others as we'd have others do unto us. And I'm not gonna get religious on you because I'm not qualified. But my feeling is, that if God wants you to do something, and if you're atheist, let's say nature, okay? So I won't get religious, like nature, the universe, let's just say God for just a good name to use. What God wants for people is to be happy and love one another. 
and treat one another the way you want to be treated. Not bashing people, squashing them down, or killing them in the name of God. He doesn't want that. He wants all people to be happy and respect one another, not step on anybody. We have 110 Paul Mitchell schools throughout the United States. Oh, 15,000 students in them. And there's something we have that's different than any other school. It's called a culture. You have to learn the culture while you're there. Yes, you will learn if you go to a Paul Mitchell school how to be a great hair stylist, how to be a great hair cutter, a great hair colorist. You will learn all this. How to merchandise, market, display. But you'll learn a culture that I think every university, every high school, just every school should teach, and they don't. And the culture is how you love yourself, people around you, how to communicate with people you haven't communicated with in years, how to break that bound, and how to take care of your own community, your own state, your own country, and the whole world. Everyone that goes to our school participates for a couple of months into a fundraising program. And if you do really, really well, 2,500 of you get all expenses paid to Las Vegas for a special training program and a concert and just the best time in the world. But when you raise the money, all the charities we pay for, not one dime of the money they raise goes to anything but the actual charity itself. Everything from Alzheimer's disease uh, to helping people with Children's Miracle Network to feeding orphans in Africa where their parents have died of AIDS. A roundabout thing. Well, these students, and by the way, last year they raised $1,200,000. These are students, okay? Will they ever meet the orphans in Africa? No. Will they ever meet the people that have Alzheimer's disease where you're teaching their family or the organization is teaching them how to deal with people who are losing their memory? No, probably never will. Will they meet some of these kids that we help out where they're not turned down from, for any medical reason to the hospital? No, probably never will. But why do they do it? Because they know while they are alive and a student and in their life, they can give back and change their country and the world for a better place to live because they are here somehow participating. Well, in the participation, it starts with you. We talk to people about how to love yourself. You may come in one day, everything went wrong, you're really bummed out, which happens to everybody. We're humans. Well, here's an affirmation you could read, or here's how to talk to another student or one of the instructors about it, or here's how to do with it yourself. The biggest one is this, and you don't have to raise your hands, because what I'm going to tell you is going to affect more than 50% of the people in this room. But I'll tell you about it, I'll tell you how to overcome it, and uh, go forth and be happy. Many times in life, from your younger days, your school days, maybe right now, there may have been someone in your life. It could be your mother, brother, father, relative, dear friend, significant other, husband, wife, something in your life. There was a communication break. Some in your life was pretty, pretty close to you. You wanted to be closer to them. Something happened. All of a sudden, you're not close to one another anymore. Something happened. Example is, you know, divorces. When you first met your husband, your wife, your significant other, whatever, when you first met somebody in your life, boyfriends, girlfriends, they were the most important person. Oh, you couldn't separate us. But so many months or years later, you end up not liking each other. Sometimes it's in school, sometimes it's with relatives. It just happens in life because we're humans. Now, if I were, and I, Kate, you're the closest I've became used to you. If, we, if, if you confront the person, they're going to be human. Boy, you know, you were really wrong in high school. You passed all those terrible rumors about me, and that, you never apologized. You were wrong. First thing she's going to do is say, absolutely not. That's not how it went. Look what you did. People are normally defensive. It's the first thing that happens. You're going to defend your position. It's normal, it's human. But we're at it again. How do I break that bond with my mom, my dad, brother, sister, uncle, with anybody? I allow her to be free enough to tell me anything she wants. And the way I do it is this. We were the best of friends. Call them on the phone or see them face to face either way. Hi, we were, I have to talk to you. This has been on my mind so long. We were the best of friends. We grew up together, grammar school, junior high, high school, and all of a sudden something happened. Whatever I did, whatever I said or did to offend you, please forgive me. That's not me. I'm a different person. That's not me. Will you please forgive me for whatever I may have said or done that offended you? Please, it's not me. Well, in half the cases, 
The other person says, oh my God, I'm so glad you called me. Oh my God, I've been wanting to call you for years. It wasn't you, it was me. There's, let's talk and you're crying, and you're happy. You have coffee or tea or shot a Patron together or something. <laughs> <laughs> or shampoo your hair with Paul Mitchell. <laughs> In other words, something. All of a sudden, you allowed the bond to be broken. If you do this with people, 90% of all people are going to respond and say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you called me. Yeah, this went wrong. Let's talk about it. What happened? And in many cases, it was somebody said something to you about someone else that wasn't true. There was this great book written called The Four Agreements, Four Ways to Live Your Life. And I believe it was the second agreement, and the, the author was Don uh, Miguel Ruiz, R-U-I-Z. The second agreement is never gossip or listen to gossip. Because if you listen to gossip and tell somebody else, all of a sudden they'll tell somebody else. It spreads. Now you find out what you were told was not true. Now, do you go back to everyone and said, no, that, that wasn't true. Tell everybody you told. That was a lie. Somebody told me a rumor. You can't. It's out of control. Don't pass gossip or ever listen to gossip. It may not be true. And you're not going to live a happy life if you do that. And you know people in your lives that you know, just want to tell you all the scoop, all the bad stuff that's going on. Well, that's your choice. You can hang out with people and want to tell you all the bad stuff. Or hang out people want to tell you the good stuff on how to make things better in life, opposed to all that's going on wrong. So look at how cool our lives are. Look at all that's going on wrong there. Also, what does giving give you? If you give to somebody that never says thank you, never knows you did it, what is your reward for it? I'd like to give you a little example of philanthropy. When I was six years old, I grew up my mother, my brother, and I. We grew up in Echo Park, L.A., downtown L.A. We had very, very little. But we had food on the table, two changes of clothes, extra T-shirt, pair of shoes every week. Same pair, though. <laughs> Again, to let holes in them. <laughs> and it's, we didn't have a lot, but we never knew it. When I was six years old, my mom took my brother and I to downtown Los Angeles. They had trolley cars in those days, five cents. This is early 1950s. Tried the trolley car for a nickel. And then at Christmas time, there'd be all these fine department stores, Bullocks, May come, these beautiful department stores, and in these giant windows, they had all these cool Christmas decorations, puppets that move, trains going around. And my mom one day took 10 cents and gave it to my brother and I and said, boys, each one of you hold this and together walk up with this dime and put in the bucket of that guy ringing the bell. We did. Went back and said, Mom, why do we give that guy ringing the bell in the bucket 10 cents? That's three candy bars, two Coca-Colas. Remember, this is early 50s, okay? That was a lot of money, right? And my mom said to us, boys, it's to let you know something in life. No matter how bad off you think you are, there's always someone worse off than you. That's a Salvation Army. And those people are really hurt. Most don't have places to live, and people have to feed them. So it's a good thing, son. So that kind of stuck in the mind. But I'll give you the example of the most ultimate high. Now, I'm older than you guys. Most of you are probably born in the 60s and 70s. Well, I was there in the 60s. <laughs> a little different environment. I'm going to give you an example of the ultimate high. Paul Mitchell. <laughs> I didn't say any. I'm just going to give you an example of the ultimate high, OK? That's all. Didn't say I did anything. <laughs> anyway, didn't say I didn't. Didn't say anything, OK? But the ultimate high. It took, and a lot of people ask this too, when did you know Paul Mitchell Hair Care Products, John Paul Mitchell Systems was gonna be successful? Two years after I started the company. Because two years after I started was the first time we could pay our bills on time. Didn't pay them off, but paid them on time. It took that long. Every week was, please, the checks in the mail, don't cut me off. I'll de hand delivered the day after tomorrow. Oh no, I sent her the wrong address. In other words, it was miserable. I can remember not sleeping at night because I couldn't pay my bills. Did it help? No. But I didn't sleep anyways. It was just, oh, God. So it was a big deal. Every week for almost two years, we should have gone out of business. If you follow a textbook, how to do things, you would say, guys, go bankrupt, go bankrupt, go bankrupt. You just, there's no hope for you. You can't even pay your bills. And the black and white, of course, was two cents opposed to the seven cents for the color. When we hired our first person, one person a year and a half later that's when we had our first employee in the field, had to do 10 jobs. So we built a company with fewer moving parts. So two years later, our bills are finally paid on time. 
we have $2,000 in the bank each. We immediately took a dividend and fell on top of the world. Oh my God, it's 1982 now. Our bills are paid on time. We have $2,000 each. So I'm going to do something I've never done in my life when I went to a restaurant. I went to El Torito Marino del Rey. It's a chain of restaurants all over the place. And I went down there, and if you look at a menu, well, here. When you open a menu up, right? Okay, here it shows you what you get, and over here on the right side is the price. Well, if I ever went to a restaurant, I would go to the price first, see what you got, came over here and see what you get for it. Where's how much was it? Oh, 3.95, okay. So this time, okay, I'm going to El Torito. I'm, and I took a friend with me, and I'm gonna order anything I want off the left side of the menu. Carne de asada, you know, big margarita. Didn't have Patron yet, but it was okay. Big margarita, <laughs> big order of guacamole, you know, whoa, cool. So I'm with my friend there, corner of the room there, top of the world. In front of me is a table of 12 children, one Hispanic lady at one end, one Afro-American lady at the other end with her back to me, and all these children, Caucasian, Asian, black, white, everything. Every color, there was like a rainbow sitting there. And they were from the inner city. I knew because I'm from the inner city. And you know, they dressed, you, know, you could just tell. Well, the mom held it up like this, that man did what I was doing before. Three ninety five. what do you get? It was obvious that they had a very limited budget. She was ordering for all the little children there. And it was someone's special day. I don't know what made me do this. It just did. I got up. I walked into the kitchen after I did calculations. Okay, 12, 13, 14. They pick out what's the most it's going to cost them. I came to 200 and some odd dollars. Okay, now well, I got 2,000 in the bank, a credit card. I walked into the kitchen after the waiter. And I said, those kids sitting in front of me, those two moms, tell them to order anything they want. Tell them the bill's going to be picked up and the tip's going to be picked up. Anything they want. But don't tell them who's doing it. Now, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I fall in the kitchen. It was just the thing to do. Sometimes in life, the thing to do comes at you. If it does, do it. Just do it. Don't question, just do it. As long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Came up. I went and sat down. And he told the lady. And this lady must have been an evangelist. Big woman with an angelic voice. She stood up. She's about that far from me. Stood up, turned around, looked at me. Can't be this guy. Slowly looked around, <laughs> slowly looked around the entire restaurant. Maybe it took her half a minute. I mean, it was that slow, and that's a long time looking around a restaurant. You know, I ended up with me, not this guy, obviously, and I was, you know, not even looking at her. Anyway, she stands up with her back to me, maybe two feet from me, her arms raised in the most angelic voice. She must have led a choir or something. And she said loudly in this restaurant, whoever you are, God bless you. You have no idea what you're doing for me and these children. The place went silent, looked at her. God, thank you, and sat down. As she did that, goosebumps ran. Up. In fact, whenever I tell the story, there's still goosebumps. They run up and down my arms. These ran over my body. I was high as a kite. Oh, my God, did I feel like I was, wow, this must be what heaven is like. I did something for somebody else, never asked anything in return. She still didn't, never knew. When I walked out, I felt so unbelievable that day and the next day. And what made me feel good was, I did what humans should do. Something for somebody else asking nothing in return. Your reward far exceeds any thank you. You know you did it, you know you wanted nothing in return, but doing something while you're on the planet Earth to make it a better place to live because you are here. Now, I know we're limited for time, and I want to have some time for questions here. So let me open this up now. And as you know, I'm in a variety of businesses. Patron did start, by the way, 21 years ago. We started Patron. I'll tell you that just real fast. We wanted to give uh, the world the finest, mellowest tequila on the planet. So uh, my partner, Mr. Crowley, and I put this together, went down there, and Patron is made out of the finest Highlander blue agave that ever existed. When we started the company, it was so expensive to make it. We knew America wanted to treat itself with something that was good and mellow, not holding your breath when you drink tequila. We wanted something that was higher end, that once you drank it, you'd want to reorder it. Big problem. The most expensive tequilas then were five, six, seven, ten dollars $10, maybe $14 a bottle. It was so expensive to make Patron, we had to sell it for $35 to $37.95 a bottle in 1989. Who's going to pay that? It was the best 
People started drinking and wow, I don't have to hold my breath anymore. I could drink this straight. Wow, I'm not hung over the next day. If you drink a whole bottle, you're gonna get hung over, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but normally, it's not the same as regular tequila. I wanna treat myself. And it slowly grew. We were the first to ever introduce what you call a high-end ultra premium tequila throughout the United States of America. Today, Patron is the number one ultra premium tequila in the world. We're in 120 countries. 109 rap songs and hip hop songs have been written about Patron. <laughs> Three country and western songs and two pop songs, okay? We don't pay for any of this. It's in lots of movies that people appreciate it. One, it was the best quality. It was the fine, and still is today. It is the finest tequila you could ever buy today and the best we think for your body. And we even use our distillage and make it into fertilizer instead of pollutant the land. That's how we feel about it. And of course, it's also the second largest selling tequila in the world. Even though it's the highest end ultra premium, if you take all the inexpensive ones, combine them all together, we're number two in the world by bottle. Number one by far is the, the top ultra premium. Highest quality there was, finest packaging, but more important, we also give back. Not only do we make Patron in the old fashioned way in little stills, but we have an orphanage down there. I have an old folks home down there. We are rebuilding houses for the St. Bernard Project in Louisiana. Our staff goes down there to help rebuild houses. We believe in giving back and giving a lot of love. Do you have any questions or comments? Because I could be here for hours with you going through all the companies, what we did, how we started it, but let's take a few minutes with you. Any comments, criticisms, any questions you have on anything I might be able to answer for you? Anybody? Hands? There you go. There. Start with you, sir. Sorry. You, Everybody just you even have a mic. mic comes to them for the recording. So I hear a lot of people that have your entrepreneur story where they sold encyclopedias or they, I mean, what do we do today that's the equivalent of selling encyclopedias door to door? What's something street smart that we can all do? Anything you want to sell, any idea, any product, Whatever it is, just go out and do it. That's the equivalent of selling something new door to door. <laughs> I had an encyclopedia, you know, that, and they don't have door to door sales of encyclopedias anymore. If they did, every one of my kids would be forced to do that for at least six months, no matter how they did. If I had to subsidize them just for the experience, I would say it, it's anything. Anything. If you want the experience of going door to door, why don't you go and make up a little booklet or make up an information packet on what you're starting right now? Take two or three or four pages, do a whole report on what you're doing, and go door to door and say, hi, I'm a student you know, here at Stanford University. This is five pages. I want people to know about the subject. It's only one dollar. You know, here's what it is. The dollar goes to me, helps with the education, but I think it's interesting, and here's why. That's one example, selling yourself and your idea. Just one example if you want to just test it out. But I think if you say you're a student from Stanford, they'll probably be a little more accommodating, you know, opposed to, hey, I have this bushel of potatoes, and I bought it for $5, but I'm gonna let you have it for four, it's the best potato in the world, you know? In other words, your own idea, your own thoughts is a great way to get started on anything. Or grab some charity, any charity that you firmly believe in, and just go knock it on doors out. I wanna tell you a little bit about Food for Africa, I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, Kids Play New Park here in Palo Alto, anything. You just need the experience, yes sir. Thanks for talking to us today. Um, when you were losing money in your first business, um, what, I guess, what was the threshold at which you said, after this point, I'm going to declare bankruptcy when everyone said you should be declaring bankruptcy right away and what kept you going? Okay, we start losing money from day one. But I knew that if I could tell enough hairdressers about this product and get them to use it, it was better than anything they ever used in their life, and they'd want to continue to use it. It's just how many people can I talk to and keep on chasing the bill collector, you know, and at the same time, uh, you know, get the job done. I believed enough in it. Four months later, we invented something called sculpting lotion, and it became a trend two years later. So you put this lotion on, it didn't flake, you had the wet look, or you brushed it out and you had the dry, fluffy look. Or if you had straight hair, you'd put it on, put waves in your hair, let it dry, they would stay there brush your hair, the waves are still there. Rinse it out, it disappears instantly, no buildup. But nobody knew it. It was all word of mouth, word of mouth. So we knew that we wanted to be in the reorder business. So I knew I would tell enough people we'd be able to keep up with our supply, because we had no money. Every dime we had that came in was inventory. And since we had no inventory, it was hand to mouth, hand to mouth, hand to mouth. But we believed what we were in, and we knew it, because the first few people would reorder. 
We just didn't have a lot of customers. We had to get out there and do it. I hope that answers your question okay for you. Questions, comments, criticisms? Yes, sir. Yes. And you didn't, you know, didn't have that experience, so why did you take a chance on you? Well, I was in the beauty industry working for major companies for nine years. And uh, I started out as a salesperson with one company and became their national manager in a year and a half. So then I got into marketing, so it was obvious in sales and marketing in the professional beauty industry, I knew exactly what I was doing. There was no doubt in his mind. Very good. How to size up your partner? Very important. Whether it's your family, your friends, or someone you never met. The first thing is feel the energy. How many people you're around, you just feel uncomfortable around them? You get somebody like that, that's not your partner. Yeah, when you feel that the, the, the universe, the, the, uh, the frequency of this planet is rising right now, and more and more people could feel other people out a lot quicker than ever before. First thing is, if you feel odd around somebody, that's not your partner. Next thing is, Write down on a piece of paper. Here's what you bring to the partnership. What can the other person bring to the partnership other than just money, if it is money? In other words, what influence, what can they do to help build your business? And how are they planning to do it? Interview them, like you're interviewing for a position, a partner. What can you bring to it, and why do you like this? Why do you think we're going to make it together, and what are you willing to do, and do we like each other? Also, go to breakfast or lunch with them. Go to breakfast or lunch with them. Hang out a little bit. Just don't rely on interviews. Sometimes you have breakfast and you have lunch or a dinner, you get to know the person. You get to see them in a social environment, not just a business environment. So get to know them first and get that feeling for that person, what they're going to bring to the table. Is it synergistic? Synergism meaning one plus one doesn't equal two. It equals three, four, five, or 20. Is that going to happen when the two of you together? Is it going to be a synergistic thing where you each bring something to one another and you know you like each other? If you don't like each other, that's not your partner. If they're a mean person, that's not your partner. If when you're talking to them, they criticize other people, that's not your partner. If they don't believe in a nice, positive way of life, that's not your partner. If they're not honest, that's not your partner. If they don't want to make the world a better place to live, that's not your partner. If they're not exciting, that's not your partner. And you don't have to be an extrovert to be excited. You just have to believe what you're doing is really cool. And you can have like a quiet excitement. That's excited. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. We should next. Phenomenal entrepreneurial successes that were preceded by um, emotional and financial hardship. Yes. I'm assuming that you've had several others uh, that proved unsuccessful. And I'd like to know what your internal dialogue was like throughout those you know, ventures sure. and what you told yourself to kind of keep going. Okay, well, in using that, let me give you a better example to answer your question of things that weren't successful. I was in my car, there was no money. And what little money we had, $700 between Paul and I, that paid for the silk screener, period. I had no money. I went to my mom, did not tell her how things work, because I was doing well. I had a nice home on Moho and Drive. Said, Mom, can I borrow a few hundred bucks right now? I'm just short with cash. Oh, sure, son. Everything okay? Yeah, it's fine. And the big failure was, how am I going to eat and sleep for the next couple of weeks while I'm selling this and the stuff's coming in to sell? How am I going to exist? That was the biggest challenge of them all. And I knew no matter what, I'll somehow figure a way to get by this one no matter what. I slept in my car for two weeks. I showered at Griffith Park. They had public showers down there. For 99 cents, I went to the Freeway Cafe. You find these things out when you're really hurting. You know, how do you overcome this problem? Went to the Freeway Cafe for 99 cents. After 9 o'clock, they wanted people to come by, truckers. So they give you one egg, one piece of toast or sausage or bacon, and uh, one glass of juice or coffee and your toast. So I had one egg. Sausage was a bigger one. One sausage, one piece of toast, one orange juice. That was my breakfast. Well, come the afternoon, you're getting hungry. Well, at a lot of these big places, these big chains, to get people to come in there and order at 4.30 to 6 o'clock, they have happy hour, 99 cents, any well drink you want. So I'd go in there for a 99 cent margarita, and they also had food to keep you there. I'll tell you, 20 chicken wings later, and a whole bunch of salsa, you had your vegetables, your full meal, and you're feeling good. And then, so that's how I survived. 
and still put some gas in the car, then got this business going till the first sale was able to be made. Along the way, other little businesses that I started, one was a consulting business a year before I started John Paul Mitchell Systems. I was a consultant. I knew the beauty industry inside and out. If I went to you and you could pay me, I told you everything you had to know in three months. You didn't need me anymore. I was out of a job. If you really needed me badly, I was running your company for you, and it was two to three weeks behind trying to pay me. That was going nowhere, so I moved on to something else. Also, since Paul Mitchell and, of course, Patron Tequila, John Paul Pitt, and other adventures, I've started other little things that didn't quite work as well, but I did have Paul Mitchell there you know, as my backstop, so it wasn't really a thing that was overly challenging. The biggest one was Paul Mitchell and eating and finding a place to sleep, which was my car and existing for a couple of weeks and still put your jacket on and your stuff in the car to deliver where nobody knows you're really down and out. That was really the tough one, but I believe what we did was right. There was a young lady here first, and then we'll get you, sir. Um, you had indicated that uh, your product, you talked about your product. Yes, ma'am. Correct. And that was the fact that you could leave the rinse. The, the conditioner, conditioner in your hair. It's a leave-in conditioner. Hair. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how that played into the timing of that and the innovation of the Certainly. use of perms? And you the, betcha. Great question. All part of a movement, basically, you got it. Yeah. and you were in the timing. We, the the timing was incredible because here you had people and salons that had a perms were a big deal in those days. Had to perm people's hair, for example, and you had people backed up. So we looked at what does the salon need? Well, maybe we cut some time there, one shampoo instead of two, and you pick up another ten minutes if you're not rinsing and putting the conditioner out the back basin. So that's time and money. That's unique. Also, as you said about perms during the time and blow drying, people were perming and blow drying, perming and blow and just ruining their hair. And when they had perms, this leave-in conditioner, you could leave in your hair as a perm when it dried instead of freaking out on you, it was under control and you had all the curls in. So the timing had a lot to do with it too. It was a, a good time. It was a good time to come in. We saw the need in the marketplace. Find the need in the marketplace that someone else didn't find and push that. Or find the need in the marketplace that no one else is promoting and promote it. Yes, sir. Got a question over here. Sorry, this will be the final question. Okay. I wanted to ask your question. Okay. I wanted to commend your, your attrition rate with your employees, but can you speak a little bit about employee selection? Sure. First thing I do when we interview people and up until a year ago, I interviewed everybody, but now we're getting pretty big in a few countries, so I have to rely on my president to do some interviewing with me. But it's just what I told this other young man about finding a partner. If I'm interviewing you, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'll have your resume in front of me, but I'm not going for your resume. I'm going for how I feel about you and the energy that's coming from you to me. I'm going for the soul, not for the thing the soul is occupying and not the resume that you filled out. I'll look at the resume and refer to various things on the resume. I go straight towards the person. One girl, for example, that heads up uh, part of my uh, research and my trademarking department, I went to the Pomona Mall and she was there at Christmas time for a charity trying to raise money. She was the happiest, most incredible lady. I have a young lady, 20 years old, I've ever met. Oh, how you doing? Oh, we have this charity here. and You don't have to give us a lot of money, but on your way out, if you want to give us a quarter or anything, it helps the kids. I could not believe this personality. As I left, I said, if you're ever interested, boy, do I have a job for you at John Paul Mitchell Systems. Yeah, I don't have a job right now other than I'm helping charities. She was my receptionist. Her personality was so overwhelming. That year, we gave everybody bonuses in the year. That year, she got one of the biggest bonuses in the company, and she was a receptionist because of what she did. So I go for the person. I go right for the person, the soul. How do I feel about that person? Then I go into some of the necessities that we might need for the job. You know, some of the things that, that you know, can you use a computer? Uh, you know, can you talk on a phone? You know what I mean? Can you write? You know, and we go towards, you know, the things, with, the technical things. But the first thing is I go for that soul. I go for the entity. Again, the frequency of the planet is rising. People are becoming more aware. And you say, well, how can you prove this? I'll prove it to you with one statement. Per capita, because there's a lot more people on this planet than there ever was before. Per capita, there are more individuals and groups into philanthropic endeavors, or what can I do to help the planet and others out more than ever in the history of this planet, per capita, not just because of a large population. Frequency has something to do with it. 
Think of you when you watch TV or listen to the news, or you read things in books years ago that have changed that aren't so true. You feel, well, wait a minute. That's not right. I'm going to challenge this. Why is this the way it is? I don't think that's right. Maybe you know, we've been believing this all along. Maybe there's something else that could be true, like the world is flat. No, I think it's round. I'm going to sail around it. The frequency is rising, and more and more people are going for it. They say 2012, and I'll finish in five, 10 seconds. 2012, Mayan calendar, it's the end. World's going to collapse. Look what's going on in the Middle East. Explosions. Uh, Armageddon. Blah, 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 blah. I think what's going to happen is in 2012 is the frequency is rising, and people are becoming so aware that all peoples are saying, this is wrong. This is right. We want more of what's right. And we don't mind helping one another out. One of the biggest things that ever happened on television a week and a half ago was in Egypt. After they took over their own government, there was a day, I've never seen anything like this, no one could ever imagine it. There was a day there where Christians and Muslims were together. They made a flag of the Christian cross and the Muslim symbol. And they said, we're reuniting together as Christians and Muslims. We both want our freedom, and we're going forth together as one. Whatever you believe in, you believe in. My way may be different than yours, but we're not going to kill you, or we're not going to degrade you because of it. We're going forward. And it was all over the streets, all over the news. I thought, wow, they should have ran that for many, many days, not just one day. The frequency of our planet is changing. It's going in a great direction. So you've got some good things to look forward to. Thank you for taking your time to be here with me and give me a chance to chat with you.